From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Morning Line with Nick Barris. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. I am Nick Barris here with you on this morning on a Tuesday. Um, as always, I'll invite you to join in the conversation. We'll get the phone number up there in just a moment. Uh, but the topic of conversation today is going to be looking at folks who are perhaps serving time in prisons or jails who were wrongfully convicted. Oh, and my microphone fell off. Let me grab it here. Um, who were wrongfully convicted and are serving time right now Maybe because of a mistake made by the prosecution, maybe um, you know the evidence wasn't there, and yet somehow they were still incarcerated. Um, and what happens in those cases? You've seen in the news recently there have been some that have been overturned, and we know there are cases, some high-profile ones, going back years that sometimes are reversed based on the fact that there was DNA, but at the time they didn't have time to test it. Now they do. There are other reasons why this happens sometimes, and there are groups and organizations across the country that focus in on trying to right these wrongs. One of them is the Tennessee Innocence Project. And we're going to talk with two um, members of that organization about what they do, how they choose their cases, and, and, and where they're going from here moving forward on, on ones that are maybe still yet to have been looked at. With us this morning, Jessica Van Dyke, Executive Director and Lead Counsel. That means you're an attorney. I am an attorney. With the Tennessee Innocence Project. And Jason Gishner with uh, your Senior Legal Counsel. I so am. you work together. You're both lawyers. You've been in the media a lot lately um, because these cases, when they happen get a lot of attention I think most people these days you know if you commit a horrible crime the mood of this country is like lock them up and lose the key okay but, they, but at the same time there are a lot of people out there when they realize someone has been wrongfully convicted what's a year of your life worth and you have seen folks that have served years years decades of their life wrongfully convicted correct yeah I mean it's it happens more frequently than I think we would like to admit really? but it does happen well, okay. what, what do you mean more frequently? Because um, how much is more frequently? What, what does that mean? So our organization fights to free wrongfully convicted Tennesseans. And we're across the entire state. So we're covering all of Tennessee from the east to the west. And while we don't have a specific number about how many people have been wrongfully convicted in the United States, we know that to date there have been nearly 2,900 people. There's a, a mm. what's called a National Registry of Exonerations. Okay. And it's a website. Anyone can look at it. It has a tremendous amount of information. But they keep track of how many people have been wrongfully convicted. And not everyone's on that list. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some people that don't make it on that list. Um, you would have to be fully exonerated. Um, to be on that list, and it only includes cases from 1989 to current. But what we know is that nearly 2,900 people, and there's a lot of people left off of that list. But 2,900 people on the list, did you say nationwide? That's nationwide. Okay. But there's some caveats to that, which right. is there are a lot of people who haven't been exonerated, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a, you're going to hear today, I think, about what a tremendous process it is to actually exonerate someone. All right. I mean, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, how do you go about choosing cases? How do they come before you for something to look at? I mean, there are so many. I mean, so many people. I mean, every day at the courthouse here in Davidson County, there are criminal cases happening and there are convictions occurring. How do you know when to zero in? Who brings it to your attention? So there's a variety of ways the cases get to us. People can write to us directly from prison and they can tell us their story. Uh, other times, lawyers reach out to us. Um, we love when lawyers reach out to us. You know, they tell us, look, I worked this case 15 years ago. I've always had real concerns that an innocent person was convicted. Will you look into it? And those are great because those have, you know, been vetted already by somebody who's given it a lot of thought. Um, when we get that initial letter, whether it's from somebody who's in prison looking for help or whether it's from an attorney, we start to dig in. We have a multi-part application process. We send out the initial portion to folks and they fill that out and we start looking into it further. So what does that mean? It means we go back and get the trial transcript. We read that. We read the appellate record. Um, and if we get through the whole proceeding and we still feel like there's something there, then the investigation just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Maybe mm -hmm. it's we interview witnesses next. Maybe it's we go find an expert, whether it's a medical issue, whether it's a DNA issue, whatever it is. And, you know, once we get to the point where we are convinced that somebody has been wrongfully convicted, you know, that's when we have the conversation with somebody about signing them up and us taking over and being on their team. Um, it's not something we do lightly or quickly. Right. Um, we go through a, a, 
a very extensive process of investigating these cases even before we sign people up as clients. I mean, it is, I can only imagine. I mean, here in the news business, I get phone calls and I have to turn day stories. <laughs> okay, but I get calls and I get letters from inmates. Um, I hear from attorneys at times. Usually when the media gets onto it, it's because of folks like you. On occasion, the media will get onto something from a letter from an inmate. I, I have a case that uh, I handled a, a while back, but it takes so much work. And again, and you know, also what you run into sometimes um, is prosecution is not always thrilled with the idea of having something they've done overturned, which bothers me. I mean, I know prosecutors will say, look, if I made a mistake and I realize it later, I'm going to redo it because justice is justice. I've locked up the wrong people. I know, I've encountered in my career prosecutors who I can tell are loath to go back even if it's pretty damn clear to them that there was a mistake made. True or not? You know, I think that really varies based on jurisdiction. I think mm -hmm. it varies based on who's working the case and what kind of mistakes were made. You know, we certainly want to create a situation where someone is willing to say, you know what, a mistake was made. Because what we know is that while some people are intentionally convicted, maybe someone intentionally does tell a lie, right, that would result in a conviction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes accidents happen, yeah. right? Like we get right. better at science. Mm -hmm. We we know more about fire science. We know more about how um, injuries can occur within you know children or or babies. So we're learning more about science, and that allows us to make better decisions about how things happened. That could be totally accidental, right? No one intentionally caused a wrongful conviction. It just happened because we didn't know what we now know. I wonder in some of these, and we'll get into more detail here, when you do go back and look, the thing that gets me is that sometimes if the wrong person's been convicted, that means the right person who committed the crime is still out there, maybe. And I know many of these cases date back years, years, and who knows what's happened. But that's what gets me is that, okay, not only do I want to correct the person who sadly has done all this time, but I want to catch the person who was responsible for this. Is that, does that ever happen in your cases when you've cleared and then force authorities to look in another direction, maybe lead to the arrest of the, the real person that was responsible? Does that happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does, and it's sort of a natural outcome of these cases, right? right and and right. sometimes and all it's, of a sudden it reopens. Well, and you know, we're investigating the cases probably the same way law enforcement is when they go back and look at them, you know. And mm -hmm. if you figure out that you know if somebody's cleared by DNA, it, it probably means that somebody mm -hmm. else is the one that was found to have done the crime, and you know that's part of it too. And you know, we're all handicapped in the same way going back looking at these cases that are 20 years old, trying mm -hmm. to find the evidence and talk to the witnesses. And it's difficult. It's a difficult process whether you're looking back to find the person who actually committed the crime or whether you're going back trying to exonerate somebody who was wrongfully convicted. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky process too though because I would venture to guess 90% plus of folks locked up are gonna tell you they're innocent. Okay, so they're going to complain and they're going to say it. And the truth is, there's no way 90% are innocent. The vast majority are guilty, okay? And so how do you, you know, get through this to, to choose it? I mean, sometimes they come to you with a lawyer. But, I mean, if you're here, if, if I'm in prison and I don't want to be there, whether I did it or not, and I hear about you, I'm going to write you a letter. You know, I think that is a possibility, obviously. But, I mean, I'm just wondering, how do you sort through it? Because I get a lot of those, and most of them I look at and I read. I mean, no, this guy did it, and I'm sorry, you know? Right, so we're going to be looking for red flags okay, that, red flag? that are part of wrongful convictions. So one red flag would be looking for eyewitness identifications potentially that are dated, right? So we're looking for eyewitness identifications that were maybe made. We're going to look and determine what are the factors? What, were the, what was the evidence of guilt? that resulted in this person being convicted. Mm -hmm. And one, one example is eyewitness identification. So we now know so much more about how eyewitnesses make identifications mm -hmm. than we did 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. And we know that there are a multitude of factors within eyewitness identifications that may affect their accuracy. So, you know, we could get a letter from someone where they're saying they're innocent. We don't have to believe when we read the letter one way or the other, right? Okay. Our job is to investigate. It's to determine more information. And so... But that's hard to do. I mean, you have to vet something because you probably get lots of letters and because the process of tracking down the eyewitness, that's hard. But you're also looking at the records. You're looking at the court file. You're looking at all of these other pieces of information that maybe weren't examined in the light 
let's say the conviction was from 1990. Okay. They weren't examined in the light in 1990 that we're examining them now in 2021. Mm -hmm. But some of the factors, and this is according to, I mentioned the National Registry of Exonerations. Some of the factors that go into wrongful conviction is a, a perjured statement, someone lies. Uh, one is official misconduct. That would be where there's some sort of misconduct by a government agent, whether it's a police department, uh, whether it's that a prosecutor didn't turn over a piece of evidence. So we want to see if all of the information exists. And another factor, mistaken identification, that's present in like 28% of wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. Then there's false and misleading forensic evidence. And Jason has had some, has really kind of taken the lead with Tennessee Innocence Project on working on some of the, the new science and how we can use new science with exonerations. Is it, before we go to the break, possible? It's, it's interesting, it made me think. All right, so as you go through and you dig up and find those red flags, when you bring it back, is it possible that you can make the case that, all right, look, the case that was made against this individual who's serving time, we look back now and there wasn't enough evidence to convict this person. Okay, meaning there wasn't enough evidence and maybe there still isn't, but it's not enough to clear them. Do you know what I mean? There's a difference. I mean, I, I've, I've talked to some prosecutors later who had cases overturned that said, look, Nick, ultimately you go back and, and they won in court and it was proven that maybe there wasn't enough. But I'm telling you, this guy did it. But we just couldn't prove it. So I, I guess under the justice system, you have to be able to prove it's the point. If you can go back. But the fact that you get someone off, does that necessarily mean they didn't do it? Look, if we're representing somebody, it, it means we believe that. That you believe they didn't do it, that you don't believe that there's not enough evidence here to convict them, it's rather we believe they didn't do it. If we are going to court on someone's behalf and we're litigating for them, we believe they're innocent. Okay, because uh, you know there are people that have committed crimes and there's just not enough evidence to convict them. Yeah, we're not looking at technicalities. We're not looking yeah. at legal arguments. We're looking at factual, actual innocence. That shows that they're actual, and that's the key. And yes. they're the folks that need the help, and they should. And that's a wonderful thing. Thank good. There's nothing worse than having someone convicted of a crime they didn't commit. I mean, you have the, the injured in that case, maybe a murder case, and then you, you're damaging that other side of the family as well. Listen, we'll take a break. When we come back, we've got some phone calls for you. We can take those calls. More of our conversation about the amazing work of the Tennessee Innocence Project right after this. Stay with us.